systematic and expository study of the Bible at the Deeper Life Bible Church offers you an enriching steady spiritual growth, thus opening your eyes to God's own way of righteousness. In this case, you will have the opportunity to listen to one such enriching Bible study. So prepare your heart to be blessed.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the love you have towards us, that you bring us together every time like this. Even sometimes when it, when it appears, some of us might be weak, tired, and there might be some suggestions in our mind, what are we going to do? Yet your spirit leads us on and gives us the unquenchable interest that will always bring us together like this so that we can hear your word. Lord, we are grateful that you have not allowed the fire to cool off. You have not allowed the zeal to die down and the interest to study your word so that we can be people who are well furnished, well equipped to serve you. Accept our praises in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that you place a great value upon our lives and upon the responsibilities you have given us and which you are still giving us. Father, we pray that as we are here today, you will open our eyes of understanding so that you will help us to see what we ought to do, where we ought to be, how we ought to comport ourselves, and the things that we have to do to see how we accomplish everything to the glory of your name. Lord, we pray today, you will make us channels of blessings to all the people. We pray, O oh Lord, that everything you want us to accomplish in this single life we have, will accomplish it to the glory of your name, to the joy of the believers, and to the edification, the profit of the kingdom of God. Father, we pray that today you will help us to understand. And you'll help us to arise, to wake up, and to do what we ought to do. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, we're still going to be in Colossians. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4. We're reading and studying the last two verses. Colossians chapter 4, from verse 17. And say to Archippus, Take ye to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Here we have the last words of this epistle. And these last words have a special instruction for Archippus in particular at that time. And for every one of us today, those of us who have received a ministry, a talent, or a responsibility from the Lord, I believe you know that every child of God, every Christian, has a charge to keep that which has been committed unto his hands. We shall be held accountable for how we made use of opportunities in the kingdom of God. Here Paul the Apostle was writing to the church at Colossae. And he said that this epistle must also be read in Laodicea. And then in this verse, verse 17, before he finished, he said, Say to Archippus. Well, he could have directed the word at him directly like he did into, in other places. And he could have said, Archippus, then he will give what the instruction he wanted to give. Like, look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. I beseech Eodius and beseech Sintike that they be of the same mind in the Lord. He didn't say, say to Eodius and say to Sintike that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Direct, he just gave the message to these two people in Philippians chapter 4 verse 2, I beseech so and so and such and such that they be of the same mind in the Lord. But here, he told the whole church to say to Archippus, to encourage and exhort Archippus, to remind Archippus and stir him up and tell him, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. How do you understand that verse? Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. The way it is, it's like this. The minister at the Colossians church, 
will receive this epistle, he will read it because everything there is for his encouragement and instructions given to him. And he, as a minister, he will tell Archippus, who also is a minister of the gospel, who also is having a responsibility. He has received a ministry. And that minister at the Colossians church will say to him, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Not only that, all the leaders and workers in that church, the deacons, they too will read this epistle or it will be read to them. And then they will be told, say to Archippus, and every one of those deacons, leaders and workers, they're going to get to Archippus one by one at the appropriate time. Everyone is going to be saying to Archippus, Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. This epistle is going to be read in the whole church. And all the members of the church are going to hear the uh, instructions in this epistle. And they are going to hear at the end of it. And you may forget sometimes what you hear at the beginning or in the middle. But the very last words you are not going to forget. And the members of the church are going to get to Archippus one by one. Respectfully, lovingly. They are going to remind him. Paul said we should say to you, Archippus. Are you considering looking back? Are you considering going back? Are you getting discouraged? Is it that there is something on your way that we do not know about that may make you to forsake the ministry? Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. It's a solemn thing that Paul the Apostle was instructing here. He exhorted the whole church to remind Archippus and to encourage him to keep faithful to the ministry and to fulfill it. The whole church must be an encouragement to the minister, challenging him, charging him, encouraging him to fulfill the ministry. If we get the message in this passage we have read now, every child of God in this church, in this local church, I mean where we are now listening to this word of God, you will see that minister, when I say minister, somebody who stands to minister to the people of God, the minister at the time of uh, the Monday Bible study or the Thursday revival hour or he may minister in a part during the service on Sunday he takes this part or that part or he ministers in the zone or he ministers in a particular area of the world and every child of God in the church one time or the other is going to be burdened is going to be concerned and is going to get to the minister in the church respectfully lovingly spiritually with real concern and with real honor to whom honor is due and is going to say to that person we want to encourage you that nothing private in your life we want to encourage you that nothing that the devil may be doing through false brethren or through sinners or through your relatives in particular we want to encourage you take heed to the ministry that thou hast received in the lord that you fulfill it you know if we all do that, to the ministers in the gospel, in our church, none will want to backslide. When you are always, when you chat with them, you don't talk about material things. All you are saying is, we benefit from your ministry. I came to the Lord through you. I became challenged through you. Some restitutions I made, I made them when I had your word. And you are always telling these ministers of the gospel, you have done so much for me in my life. You have done so much for some people I know. Take it to the ministry. Any private problem, any sin in your family that is going to describe you, take it to the ministry. That thou fulfill it. That's what we are to do. Not only that, you see, we believers, we have all received the ministry. That believer you see sitting by your side, that believer you see in the choir, the believer you see among the ushers, the believer you see in the, uh, in the children's work, all believers, we have received a talent, a responsibility. And therefore all Christians, all Christians that knows that individual believer should influence him, encourage him, admonish him every time to use his talent for the Lord, to the saving of souls. When you hear that somebody is no more using his talent for the Lord, you will not just shrug your shoulder and say, well, that's, that's his business. That's his decision. No. All believers will, be, will say this way, pestering those people. 
Always talking to those people. Always reminding those people. That's what Paul the Apostle said we should do. That we should encourage one another and tell Archippus. Tell that person. Archippus is dead now. But that person that you know. Who is a believer. Who is getting slack. Who is becoming careless. And who is not taking the ministry as received seriously. Say to him. Take heed to the ministry. That thou fulfill it. Because you received it from the Lord. What does it mean to take heed? To fulfill the ministry. We must take it to avoid all things that will sidetrack us. I said all things. It may be all things according to your mind. Examine that thing. Once that thing is going to affect the ministry you have got from the Lord. Take it. Take it. It may be a new friend. And this new friend, the way he talks, the influence he has on you, is going to affect the ministry you have got from the Lord. Take heed. It may be that you are getting persecuted. And the way this persecution is affecting you is bringing something to your mind that, after all, I don't know whether I will continue preaching. Whether I will continue a work in the church. Whether I will continue serving the Lord. Whether I will continue evangelizing. Take heed. That's what we are talking about. Anything that will sidetrack us. From fulfilling the ministry, we take heed. The joy of it is this. God's grace is sufficient for every one of us. And we are well able to fulfill the ministry. To finish the work God has given us to do. If we are willing to keep at it. Stay at it. The winds will blow. Stay at it. Rain will descend. Stay at it. Flood may come from beneath. Stay at it. The devil may try to make the fire hotter. Stay at it. Persecutors may multiply. Stay at it. If you are willing to stay at it and to endure to the end, you will find by the grace of God, we can finish. After all, we only live a day at a time. You fulfill the ministry today, waiting for tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, you say, Lord, another day has come. I will not carry the big load of the ministry for the next one year, 12 months. Just the load I need to carry of the ministry is the responsibility I need to fulfill today. If you do that a little at a time, a day at a time, and you will not look at anything that will discourage you, you will fulfill the ministry. That's what we are studying here. This is the introduction. Now, there are three points we're looking at. Number one, the received ministry. Number two, watchfulness in ministry. Number three, fulfilling the ministry. Every one of us, children of God, we need this. To start with, the received ministry. I want you to underline the word receive. The word receive. And we do not have enough time for us to examine that word receive in the Bible. But my brothers, my sisters... Let us look at a few verses that will show us that we receive from the Lord, the received ministry. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive, if, if thou didst receive it? Why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? One, if we realize that we have received the ministry from the Lord, it will keep every minister away from pride because he received the ministry from the Lord as a gift, not by marriage. Any of us, myself included, it's not because I married this, I married that. No, it's a gift. God has given me the ministry. God has given you the ministry as a gift, not by marriage. And the minister, on the other hand, will not be idle. He will work hard to show gratitude to the one who has called him to the ministry. Once you realize, I'm not qualified. I'm not capable. I'm not better than other people. All that I've received, I got from the Lord. And it is just a privilege. It is just an opportunity that will make you want to work your fingers to the bone. Work and not be tired. Even when you are appearing tired, you will say, God, give me more strength. So that I will show my gratitude 
for you counting me worthy, even though naturally I'm unworthy, unfit. Yes, counting me worthy to give me a ministry like this. Take it then. So the ministry which thou hast received. It says there, what hast thou that thou hast not received? Think of the salvation we have. Is it by marriage? By grace. We received it from the Lord. Think of the sanctification and the evidence of the sanctification. Is it by marriage? No, by grace. We received from the Lord. You have the Holy Ghost in your life. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Oh, is it because you are fervent, you are prayerful, and you are able to get that thing from God? No. We received from the Lord. And think of this ministry God has given us, the ministry of reconciliation, preaching the gospel to other people. Is it because of who we are? Is it because we are great? We received it from the Lord. Think of this special, peculiar talent you have. And people often will tell you they appreciate God in your life and they appreciate what God is doing through you. Is it by marriage? You received it from the Lord. Think of the way you spend your time. And the way and people are saying, we don't know how you spend your time. You work for the Lord. You work in an office. You do this. You do that. And the way you, just, you are just totally stretched. As if there is no extra minute available to do any other thing. How you are able to still comport yourself and do other things, we, we don't understand. You are so committed to the Lord. Is that by merit? No. You received it from the Lord. Well then, remember that we received the ministry from the Lord. And you see, Paul the Apostle himself, this is what he always realized, that the ministry of preaching, the ministry of comforting the saints, the ministry of encouraging, developing, training the believers. He received it from the Lord in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, you see that? Always remember that. The ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Take care of it. When you get something precious from the president of the country, maybe it's a medal. Maybe it's a particular letter of encouragement. Maybe it is a particular note of appreciation that maybe you did something for the country or there was something that made the president write unto you. How do you keep that letter? Do you keep it in the same file? You keep all the other letters from the village, from the, um, from the neighborhood, from the community, from those who are looking for social work or something? No. You keep it in a special place. When the boss in your place of work has written some good things about you, and then they send this thing to the headquarters, maybe the headquarters of your company is very far away, that it's difficult to get there. And eventually from the headquarters, the top man, the highest man in that whole corporation in the whole world writes a letter to you. And is saying, because of what we have heard of you, we give you this responsibility and this and that. Where do you keep the letter? How do you take care of that letter? Because of where it is coming from. You know how you keep it. Now this one is coming from Jesus. The ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. How do you keep it? How do you take care of it? How do you cherish it? How do you protect it? How do you make sure that you fulfill it? That's what we're studying. That you have received the ministry from the Lord. Take heed how you view that ministry. Your attitude to that ministry. Now let's see. When we talk of receiving the ministry, it is not just the preacher, the leader, or the one that is coordinating the whole work in our locality here. That's not the only person that has received the ministry. He has received the ministry. We thank God for him. But all of us too, we have received the ministry. Look at Romans chapter 12. From verse 4. Romans chapter 12. From verse 4. As we have many members in one body. And all members have not the same office. So we being many. Are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. Do you notice that? 
gifts differing according to the grace given unto us we received from the Lord. Then he begins to tell us different aspects of the ministry. You receive a patch. I receive a patch. My brother over there receives a part. Our sister over here receives a part. Each one has his part that he has received. Look at it from verse 6. Where the prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth. That's ministry also. He, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy, that's also ministry, with cheerfulness. So you can see the various kinds of ministries we have received from the Lord. Each of us should be reminded that the ministry is a solemn responsibility. It is God's great and precious gift because None of us is naturally qualified to be his minister. Anyone chosen by God to be a minister is inwardly called and qualified by him and him alone. And the purpose of receiving the ministry, which is for God's glory and for the furtherance of the kingdom of God, must always be placed before each minister. And I said, every one of us has a ministry. Because Christian ministry is not limited to those we often refer to as ministers of the gospel. Those who preach to large crowds in our district or in our zone. Those are ministers but they are not the only ministers. Each Christian is called to be light and salt in the earth. That's ministry. We have all received the ministry of reconciliation. You, my brother. Yes, you've got ministry of reconciliation. Sister, do you know you have a ministry? Yes, you do. You have got the ministry of reconciliation. We have been reconciled unto God. And we are to con uh, continually be pleading with the world that they should be reconciled to God. That's a ministry. We are all ambassadors for Christ. What does the Bible say? It says here, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You have a ministry. You have a ministry. You have been called into the ministry. Don't look at other people as if they are the only people having a ministry. You have take it unto it. 2 Corinthians chapter, 18, chapter 5 verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us, has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. If you notice very carefully, the word us, a very small word, two-lettered word, appears there two times. First, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you. Is it only the apostles that were reconciled unto God? Is it only the preachers, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers? Is it only the people we call leaders and workers that were reconciled unto God? No. Every believer, every Christian, every child of God, he has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now notice that word us again. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All people who have been born again, all people who know the Lord, all people, those who are children of God, He has given all of us the ministry of reconciliation. So then, you have a ministry, I have a ministry. We received it of the Lord. What are we to do concerning that ministry? Let's go back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 17, and say to Archippus, remember, Archippus is no more here, it's gone. Now, this concerns you, this concerns me. And say to, we we'll put your name there, you are the one God is telling now, is saying this to now, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. Take heed 
to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. Point two is watchfulness in ministry. What do we learn about Archippus? Well, this is not the only place where the name of Archippus was mentioned in the New Testament. Let's look at Philemon. Philemon has just one chapter. Philemon, reading from verse 2. And to our beloved Aphire and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thine house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle was writing to Philemon. And Philemon had a church in his house. And then he said, This is also written to beloved Aphire and beloved Archippus, our fellow soldier. Beloved Archippus, our fellow soldier. So what do we learn about Archippus? He has been a soldier of the cross. A soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the beginning, like a new recruit, a new soldier, he was fervent. He was determined. He had a bright vision. He had real consecration. And he was willing to march on. That Paul the Apostle, looking at his zeal, looking at his ministry, looking at his fervency, he said, we are side by side. It's a fellow soldier. But then, as a young minister, some things began to crop up in the mind and around him. And these things made him to be slowing down, less fervent, less committed. He had not backslidden. He had not left the fold. He had not forsaken the ministry. He was still at it. He was still working for God. But Paul the Apostle saw that the fire was dying down. The zeal was being cooled down. And the speed at which it was running before, that speed was being lessened. And the fervency, the commitment, it was uh, being affected by some things happening. That's why he called upon the whole church. He said, don't let this man die. Don't let his ministry die. He called on the whole church. He said, don't let him slow down. He said, everyone in the church say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received. He wanted everybody to wake him up. To wake him up. It's like when you have a, a child in the family. And you have some other children, four or five other children in the family. And this child is, uh, you know, sleeping so uh, fast and so deeply that all the four or five children, they have to go to the room and all of them uh, put all their efforts together, wake him up, pull him out of bed. And so Paul the Apostle told the old church, wake him up, pull him out of the lethargy, out of the lukewarmness in which is about getting into Say unto him, take it to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. How we need that today. That a lot of people are lethargic, cold, and yet God has still given them the ministry. And he's not withdrawing the ministry from them. And he's not saying, you will not have the ministry again. No, you still have the ministry. And you are still going to do the work. Only that he wants the whole church to wake you up, to take heed to the ministry. You see, often men who are once faithful, they grow negligent in the ministry. What are the reasons for this? Think about this and apply it to yourself. Sometimes it's because of discouragements from people. Don't let that discourage you. Don't let that make the fire to cool down. Because of discouragements from people, they are not as fervent as they used to be. Or it may be because of lack of immediate results. They are preaching. They are evangelizing, they are soul winning, and they are praying, and yet they cannot see immediate results. Because of this, they may be cooling down. Sometimes it's because of personal weakness and inadequacies they have just discovered in their lives. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God faithfully opens up their hearts, their lives to them. And they begin to see some weaknesses, inadequacies. And these things, instead of taking the challenge from the Spirit of the living God and rising up to go out and get the work done. But instead of that, they yield to discouragement. 
or because of taking more work to do than they are called to do. That's a great danger. You see, when you carry more load that is meant for you, it slows you down. It may be that you have a child in the family and you are trying to carry loads from one place to the other and you give a little uh, kind of piece to a child to carry according to his strength, according to his ability. He says, no, daddy, no, mommy, I can do more than that. And he then brings more load upon himself than daddy has given to him. His pace is slowed down. What he's trying to do is more than his little strength. The same thing many people have done. Our Heavenly Father knows the limit of our ability. He knows the limit of the grace He has given us. He knows the ministry into which we fit in. And He gives us that thing to do. And He sets the bound, the limitation of the thing we are to carry out. We say, no, Daddy, no, God, I can do more than that. And then on our own, we bring more upon ourselves. And these loads weigh us down. And these are the things sometimes that make some people to slow down. Or it may be because of pressures within and without. Depression within, tiredness within, discouragement within, pressures of, am I going to get this need met, get that need met? Pressures within, just pressing out almost out of measure. And pressures from without, pressures coming from in-laws, pressures coming from our relatives, pressures coming from our brothers and sisters in the natural, pressures coming from uh, our places of work, demands upon our lives. When those pressures come within and without, sometimes it will just make a person who had been strong, who had been fervent, to just slow down. He doesn't forsake the ministry, but he slows down. And because of these things, people who are formerly fervent, they grow weak and they grow weary of God's work. We need this exhortation constantly. What's the exhortation? Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Let's look at it again. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. How can we take heed? One, by constant meditation on the greatness of the task. You see, you have a church, you have a church responsibility. You have responsibility in the household of faith. You also have responsibilities maybe in your place of work, in your family, and other areas. Always meditate on the greatness of the task you have to do in the ministry. So that you will know this is the greatest, this is the highest, this is the most important, this is a spiritually eternal one, this is the one that will make you either happy or unhappy in eternity. Always meditate on the greatness of the task in comparison with the smallness of the task in other areas of life. Number two, always consider the importance of of your responsibility. Number three, weigh the duty of saving never dying souls from eternal ruin. Weigh it. You'll see how weighty it is. And number four, you must always bring the accounts we must render to God on the last day before you daily so that that will keep you alert and dedicated to paying the great price for the salvation of souls. You see, if we do this, we'll be taking heed to the ministry that we have received of the Lord. Look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Take heed unto thyself. Your, what, the thoughts that are coming to your mind, the suggestions that are coming to your mind, the discouragements that may be arising from your mind, the pressures within and without, all things happening, take heed, take heed, don't let them affect you or affect the great ministry God has committed into your hand. That's another part of taking heed. Take heed unto the doctrine. Take heed unto the doctrine. First Corinthians chapter 3. From verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 10. 
according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. We are to take heed to what we build on a foundation. You are working in an area of the work in the kingdom of God. Others have laid the foundation. The foundation of this ministry. I'm talking now of deeper life in particular. In the early years, we laid a strong foundation. Now, you are called into the work now. It may be in the house fellowship, maybe in the choir, maybe among the ushers, maybe among the area leaders, maybe among our women, our folks, maybe among our men. Whatever it is, you are having a part in the ministry. You are building on the foundation. Take heed or you build thereon. We are not saying it's impossible for you to build right or difficult for you to build right. After all, we do a little at a time. When you are building, you take a block and place it on that place at a time. And if you just take it to set that little block, all right, that's all right. And then you take another block a little at a time. Then you place it in the place squarely. That's how to do it. It's not difficult. You live a day at a time. And all that you have to do today, just take heed and make sure that by the grace of God, you do it according to the principle of Scripture. You appreciate the foundation that had been laid. And now you are building in a way to help that foundation still remain intact. You don't destroy the foundation and what you are building on is still in line with the foundation. You do that a day at a time. If we take it like that, the work will prosper. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereon ye do well that ye take heed. A more sure word of prophecy that we have. More sure word of prophecy. Ye take, you do well when you take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Verse 20 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When we mention prophecy, or we read about prophecy, many times some people don't understand. But look at the three times prophecy is mentioned here. Verse 19, more sure word of prophecy. Verse 20, no prophecy of scripture. Uh, verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. The prophecy being referred to here is the totality of the word of God. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, I see it will rain tomorrow. That's the day we are talking of concrete prophecy. Prophecy about the coming of Christ. Prophecy about whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. He has not called yet. If he will call, he will be saved. That's prophecy. And that if we follow the Lord in holiness, eventually he will receive us unto glory. We have not gone into glory yet, but if we live in holiness, he will... That's talking about the future. It is a prophetic word. When we talk of prophecy, there are some people that will think that prophecy is uh, that you have a pain on the side of your tummy here. And then they are saying, I congratulate myself, I am prophesying now. We are talking of something more serious. And we have a more sure word of prophecy. Take heed that you will keep to it. You do the word of God. You will abide with the word of God. We take it unto the doctrines of the Bible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Reading from verse 1, verse 3, and verse 4. We then, as workers, together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse 3. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. That's how to take heed to the ministry. You watch your life. 
you watch your comportment. As you are going on the street, as you are sitting in the bus, as you are with other people, you watch your attitude, your behavior, your comportment, so that you will not give offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Verse 4, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. That's how to take heed to the ministry in Revelation chapter 2. Verse 25 and verse 26. But that which ye have received, hold fast till the end. The doctrine of the word of God, the teaching that we have received, hold fast till the very end, till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Let's keep that word, that work, till the very end. Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing, which thou, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. That's how to take heed to the ministry. Take heed to the word we have learned. To take heed also implies watchfulness over yourself as a minister, as a preacher of the gospel. And also over the doctrines that you teach. The minister must be apt to teach. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Giving everyone his portion. Everyone that comes to the church, sinners come. He gives them the portion appropriate for sinners. New converts are born into the kingdom of God. He gives them the portion appropriate for them. The people need to be baptized in water. He gives them the portion that they need to learn in readiness to appreciate the, and they have assurance of salvation and be, get, well, get baptized in water. He gives them the portion that they need. People, young people are coming to the church and they need to know how to comport themselves, how to relate together between brothers and sisters. Even when we sit together as brothers and sisters, he knows how to teach those sisters to sit and not be a temptation to the brothers that are sitting very close to them as they are sitting tight together. He knows how to give the right portion, the appropriate portion to the women, to the young ladies and to the men, to the young men as well. He gives the right portion, the appropriate portion, to the people that are living together, working together. If uh, he sees that as these people are working together, they offend one another, or they cheat one another in some ways, that maybe they do not know they are cheating one another, or the fellow cheating his brother is not very conscious of the cheating, he gives them the appropriate word. You see, we as ministers must be giving everyone his portion. And he doesn't allow people who have been saved to remain saved and just saved, saved, saved five years without moving on, pressing on, pressing forward. He presses them on, encouraging them, challenging them to pray and be sanctified. And those who have been sanctified, he doesn't let them remain there just uh, sitting down there without fire, without power, without the Holy Ghost anointing upon their lives. He gives everyone his portion. And the people who are planning marriage, oh, he gives them their portion. It shows them how to comport themselves, how to live righteous life, how to uh, know the will of God, go on in that will of God. And when they are trying to do the uh, introduction and the pain of dowry and also the wedding, he gives everyone his portion. And I said, uh, these families are, you know, getting settled, having children, having to think about spending money, having some disagreements on how to spend money, how to manage things at home, how to make everything work out so appropriately. It is a minister that will know how to rightly divide the word of truth and give everyone a portion. And a minister will be diligent not to destroy the doctrines of the word of God with passion, with emotion. And then he will patiently endure and labor in the ministry. The minister must take heed to new, of the new errors that will daily arise. That's how to take heed in the ministry. 
new errors are coming up every day. False doctrines are increasing every time. The Antichrist, because it is near the time of the catching away of the saints and of the coming in of the Antichrist, is already sending all these many false doctrines and false teachers as the forerunners that will come before him. And the church, in the nominal church, there is a falling away. There were people that believed the Lord before, but they are falling away from the truth. The wise minister, like Paul was saying to Archippus, take heed to the ministry, telling the whole church to uh, impress it upon him. Take heed to the ministry which you have received. The same thing, if you are taking it to the ministry, you will be watching against errors that will daily arise. And of the subtle compromises of the people, you see the ladies will be compromising little by little on dressing. And uh, the people may be compromising little by little on being like the world, watching the shows of the world, television of the world, things of the world. You see, the real minister will be watching the subtle, clever compromises of the people and he will be taking heed. He will be warning them and of men's fancies and Satan's methods that will attempt to influence and change the minister. The minister will take heed of hypocrites, many of them that may come around. They will take heed, the ministers will take heed of the open adversaries or the domestic vipers. There are some serpents that are domestic. What I mean is they have the nature of the snake, of the serpent, the old serpent, and they are right within the fold. They will bite at the back and put their poison in the minister, poison his mind or even poison the minds of members of the church. Domestic vipers, the minister will take heed of them. He will take heed of falling foes and false brethren. You see, we need to take heed. And that will then lead to fulfilling the ministry. The purpose of taking heed, the purpose of all the warning, all the challenge, all the exhortation, is that you will fulfill the ministry. Let's look at Col Colossians again, chapter 4, verse 17. And, and say to Archippus, take heed. Heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be unto you. Amen. These words are very fascinating, very instructive. Let's start from Paul the Apostle. It had always been the intention of Paul the Apostle, the desire of Paul the Apostle, that he himself will fulfill his ministry that has always been his consecration and he never looked back away from it look at it acts of the apostles chapter 20 acts of the apostles chapter 20 verse 24 but none of these things move me neither count i my life dear unto myself so that i might finish that's the word so that i might finish my cause with joy and the ministry, that is, so that I might finish the ministry, fulfill the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That had been his intention all the time. And was he able to do it? Oh yes, he was. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 17 and verse 18. And say to Archippus, Take heed to fulfill the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. The reason I've read verse 18 in connection with verse 17 is to show you something. Actually, Paul the Apostle was writing from the prison. He was at Rome at this time. And he was in the prison. And if you knew the condition of the prisons at that time, you wouldn't think that Paul would be able to do anything in the prison. Let me just tell you a little one. Their legs were in the stalks, bound. And many times, the stalks, that is the wood, they will uh, make a hole in the wood. And then it will be as if it's sliced into two. When you bring the two pieces together, it will be like a hole that the leg can pass through. 
then they will bring the two pieces together around the leg and then they will fasten those things together so that you cannot pull your leg away from that hole they do that to the two legs so that the two legs do not have any freedom at all because this is always like that you know when you have a shoe how sometimes it inconveniences you and it gives you some sores in your feet in your in your leg now the stalks will many times make marks and have real sores and these sores are not treated by by the people the sores are just there not only that the prisons were in a smelling condition there was no good lighting system in those prisons and they wore clothes that were given to them by the prison officials not only that they were chained to soldiers so that they will not be able to run away they were treated like criminals and then they could call them any hour of the day any hour of the night to come and answer questions as their prosecutors will be wanting to examine them this was the condition of paul the apostle and paul the apostle said archippus young man look at what i'm going through and yet in the prison here i'm still fulfilling my ministry i am still praying for the churches and as part of my ministry, I am still having care and concern for the churches. I am still receiving reports of the various churches from the people that come to me in the prison here. And I am still writing epistles and letters to them, encouraging them, stirring them up, and telling them to remain faithful unto the Lord. He said, young Archippus, here in the prison, remember my bonds. Remember that I'm in the prison. I remember the limitations of the prison life. And yet, I'm writing epistles. I'm praying for the churches. I'm sending encouragement to the churches. I am fulfilling my ministry. He said, if the grace of God is with me here, uh, you are in the free world. You are not in the prison now. That same grace can be abundant for you. And you can fulfill the ministry. The same thing the Lord is telling us here. If Paul the Apostle, with all the shipwrecks, if Paul the Apostle, with all the beating, if Paul, if Paul the Apostle were the false brethren, were the Jewish enemies, with all the things he went through, if he wrote 14 epistles out of the, in the New Testament, and if he prayed for all the churches, if he did so much in evangelization and consolidation of the lives of the believers, what can we not do? We are not in the prison like him. We have not suffered persecution like him. Our lives are not restricted and limited like his life was restricted and limited in the prison. Therefore, we should know that the grace of God is sufficient for every one of us. If he finished and fulfilled, then we can do it. God has set bounds of the ministry that he gives to every minister. He has given us responsibility and he has put some limitations. He has said, this is the area, the coverage of our ministry. And he expects us to fulfill that appointed ministry. Each one has a ministry. Each one has a sphere of service. Which is, which is to fulfill with earnest devotion. We must think much on the received ministry. Think of its extent, its nature, its imperativeness, the manner of discharging it, and the means of fitting you for the work. To fulfill the ministry, the minister has to faithfully perform all duties with due respect to all the charge received from God. He must show the people all the counsel of God. He must rebuke all sorts of sins and all sinners. He must faithfully do every kind of work that belongs to the ministry, whether public or private. When I say public or private, that means public preaching, private praying. Public counseling, private praying. That is, there is this ministry that is still going on, even in the night, as you are praying for the church, as you are praying for the people that you have contacted with the gospel, as you are praying for the people that have received the word of the Lord through you or through the church. So then, you are faithfully discharging all, the, all your responsibilities belonging to the ministry, whether it's public preaching, public ministration, or private praying. The whole truth must be declared. The declaration of the truth must be full and courageous. Let's look at it and let's see what the Lord is telling us. Look at this in Colossians chapter 4 verse 17. And say to Archippus, look up here. Archippus is gone. Archippus is dead. You 
are the one the Lord is speaking to now. What's the Lord telling you? Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Let's, Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God himself will help us, qualify us, and help us to be vigilant and watchful. That will take it to the ministry that we have received. Please pray. Pray in the message. Consider every part of the message in the prayer. And let God really write this upon your heart in a way that nothing will ever be able to take it away. That you will take it to this ministry you have received. That you will fulfill it. I believe you have been blessed. Don't let this message die. Listen to it again and pass it to others. You can get more from God at the Deeper Life Bible Church. Our headquarters is Deeper Life Bible Church, Bagada, Lagos, Nigeria. Blessed are your ears for hearing these things. We'll meet in heaven if you do them.